Good morning. How are you, Kent? Very well, thank you. How are you awesome. doing? I'm, I'm great. Uh, I'm so happy that uh, you accepted my invite and we, we are talking now about some issues we have <laughs> in, in the in the like from my like my region. Um, like so, uh, some people talk a lot about like agile and uh, um, what constitutes it. And um, they basically uh, the problem that we have is we are following too much books. We don't uh, we don't have our own and like we don't put our touch on it. So uh, we are at a point where the process became more important than people <laughs> and um, like the customer and the, 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 uh, the, the, the people who work on the software. Um, and basically, um, I have sent you some questions and um, uh, one of the things that basically, um, like personally, I, I had to deal with is uh, when the when the people who manage the projects get in the way and basically, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a software engineer, I know the problem, I'm trying to fix it. Um, I go meet the client sometimes and I know exactly what they need, but I have to go through so many things. Um, sometimes I have to shut up <laughs> because it's my living. I can't do much about it. Um, and sometimes I can resist. But from your perspective, um, like what is the argument that we can make that this is not going to work and it, it's hurting the, the client and us? Because basically it's a very limited vision for what the owner want or the project owner want versus what actually need to be done. Yeah, so I'm I'm managing a team right now that um, uh, w where we have a, a complicated project, um, we don't have the opportunity for frequent feedback. Uh, really, only once a quarter do we get to see new functionality go live, and uh, the pressure on me and on our team to to provide precise uh, predictions of what we're going to do in the future. It's really intense. And so the first thing I do when I'm faced with that kind of situation, the, the easiest thing to do would be to just cave in and, yeah. okay, they, they want a prediction, I'll make a prediction. And that creates a, a horrible situation for everyone involved because I know it's not true. The customer knows it's not true my managers know it's not true I, like everybody knows that this is that this is it's just not the truth you know here's where we're going to be here here here's the feature i'm going to add in the ninth month mm. like I, nobody knows yeah and once you make that prediction now now you've gone um uh, uh you're, you're negatively convex so uh so one of the tools that I use to think about situations is this idea of convex versus concave. Convex is is a situation where uh, where you have a small investment and most of the time you lose it, and every once in a while you have a big gain. So uh, a lottery ticket is convex. Mm -hmm. um, reading a book is convex. Because usually uh, you read a book, it's not going to change you very much. But every once in a while, it completely changes the, how you think about something. So um, convex situations uh, uh, create uh, the possibility of big, big outcomes. But a negatively convex situation is one where usually you don't gain very much. And every once in a while, you lose everything. Yeah. Yeah. So when when you're in uh, when when I've made that prediction, I've become negatively convex because if I hit my prediction, mm -hmm. I'll get a, a little pat on my bald head, and if I miss it though, oh, you know, I might get fired, I'll get yelled at, I'll be told shame on you. Mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. So. What a, that's a horrible position for me to be in. What happens if if a month into this nine month project we realize, oh no, this is this is a wrong direction to go. We want to go in a completely different direction. We have a strong incentive not to change at that point. Yeah. If you can establish a relationship, and this is hard work, and it took us quite a while. If you can establish a relationship where <clears throat> you're discovering what to do together and everybody trusts all right 
the teams going as fast as they can go and they're learning and they're going faster tomorrow than they went today okay well we don't need in that case you don't need to predict exactly where you're going to be so to me that's that's the the key difference is people people want to avoid relationships and replace it with with uh rigor with uh pr false precision because mm -hmm. you know the that lo that long-term pr prediction is very precise in a way even though it's not true uh <laughs> And and relationships are like all relationships are messy, and you gotta negotiate, and you're gonna you're gonna do some stuff that damages the relationship sometime, and you have to make up for it, and like yeah, it's, it's that's hard work, but I I don't see another way to get to really good outcomes with software development. The um, the 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 thing is um, the owners like of of those projects and the management think basically. Uh, like we heard about the um, um, like being um, the like they basically read about like agile and it can solve lots of problems and this kind of thing then uh, they dig in then they find the uh, scrum masters and uh, let's let's do that let's 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 teach people how the problem is the people they don't understand what to do and we will bring more people like more process to like m like engineer their like life inside this eight hours work and at the end, it's it's still like it's fake. Uh, I see it as fake because people sometimes doing it. It's like yes, I don't understand why I'm why I'm doing this, but I'm doing it because they ask me to do. Um, it took me at least five years to understand. It's like yeah, that's useful, but uh, no one explained it like in a way where I can comprehend what should I do in this in in this process. How can I optimize it? Um, like even now when I understood it. Um, I decided to cut off some pieces because um, I don't see use for it in, in my day-to-day -day work and I added more stuff um, like maybe some documentation and instead of meeting let's let's like write a collaborative document um, because people are in different time zones and we we, we shouldn't have like to make every everyone miserable <laughs> to have like one hour meeting or something um, so from your perspective the 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 concepts that that, that that the whole industry of people building on that on that that engineers don't understand what they have to do but what do you think about that so i was in the same position 25 years ago yeah when when uh i, I was asked to lead the, this team at at chrysler um there there was lots of advice for how to develop software and you, you need these documents and you need da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. and i also didn't understand I, I at that point I'd, I'd had 10 12 years of professional programming experience yeah. and it still didn't make any sense to me and so I just decided to stop I said mm -hmm. if I don't understand it I'm not gonna do it and we'll see what happens next mm -hmm. like maybe it'll be a disaster maybe all the books were right and my intuition was wrong the three things that I know are essential to a programming project are listening because everybody doesn't know the same thing and the the creation of the software changes the landscape so even if you started out knowing everything the first line of code you write changes the world so you don't let you now you don't know everything anymore so we have to listen to each other we have to write programs we know that because without programming there's not a programming project yes there's a lot of other stuff that has that you know that needs to happen we we have to listen to each other because we need to learn we have to write programs and uh and the third one is we have to write tests because mm -hmm. as programmers we make mistakes we want some things to remain the same and we want to ensure that that's true. We want some things to change. We want to ensure that that's true. So those are the, those are the three basics, and everything else is window dressing on that. Now that's okay. a very programmer centric uh, way of looking at the world. Uh, designers have a strong role to play 
in development too, but not at the expense of those activities. Um, I'm I'm seeing a return of the of waterfall style development. Okay. You know, I and I'm old enough now. I start saying kids these days. Ugh, kids <laughs> these days. I have kids these days come up to me and say, you know, we we have this we have this chaotic, messy process. If we just wrote down exactly what we were gonna do before we did it, you know, this <laughs> all would be so much simpler. And I'd say, kid. Yeah, that doesn't work. Let me tell you some stories. Yeah. And uh, but, like, if if that process worked, it'd be great. Everybody would be able to see exactly what was going to happen. Then that's exactly what would happen, and we're finished. Oh, that that's a it's a wonderful story, and it just it's too bad that it doesn't work. Not at all. Mm -hmm. um, do you think the problem that we usually face is because we are not capable of understanding what needs to be done or is it the platform that we are building on is not stable enough or like because when I look at it sometimes it's the uh, the assumption that I have about the problem is the problem it's like yeah I, I think I know what's what need to be done then when I the more I work the more I understand more the more it's like, oh my God, I, I didn't fully understand last month. It's like, that's like too much information in like this during time and I need to change stuff. So it's like going uh, sort of um, that the decision to go somewhere um, is like, yeah, I want to go there. But the path is is like, I assume it's a certain way. I will dig it in a certain way, but it doesn't ever work the way I expect it to work. Um, so it, like from my perspective, um, like from your perspective, I mean, um, d do you think it's it's our understanding? It's like we don't leave enough clues for ourselves to like know how did we get there uh, or, or should we, for example, um, like now I feel that documentation very important. It's like five years ago, it's like like code is documentation and that's it. It's like I, I don't need to write more documents. But uh, but now, given that it's um, the, the, the architecture it's like basically needs a documentation. It's like it, it can't be represented because code is like code is like very <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on. Right. So so th this is another kids these days moment for me. Yeah, sure. Back in the day, oh, we have to document absolutely everything. So we had with literally Tons. shelves full of printed paper yep. that no one ever read. Okay. So, so here's the problem. I'm not going to tell you don't write docs. I'm going to I'm going to lay out a process by which you can figure out which docs you should write. Okay. Documenting something has has leverage when the information doesn't change much and the audience is large. Okay. Right. That's it, we're in a trade off. This is the this is my symbol for a trade off. We're in a trade-off space. If, if so, JUnit is a good example where the JUnit API, you know, we we had while while I was working on the project, we had really, really two generations where there was the it wasn't changing very much. The API wasn't changing very much, and there were a, a million people using it. Yeah. So. It makes perfect sense to write documentation if you're if you're you know you should yeah, document yeah. more yeah, yeah, yeah if you're yeah. in that kind of world yeah. Let, let's say you're in an internal project it's just you and one other person somebody comes in it's tempting to say well I should write documents for them but, but there's no leverage it's much faster to just explain it to them you yeah. know let's get in let's pair on some tasks and then you'll understand. And along the way, I'm going to go I'll say, well, why are things like this? And you say, sometimes mm -hmm. you say, well, there's a good reason for that. Da -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you say, oh, no, it was just a mistake. Let's fix it. Yep. Or that was a mistake. I'd like to fix it, but I don't have time. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. It might it, it feels good to document things. There's there is value in it to. to you as the writer you're forced to understand things better yeah. but you're in a trade-off space yeah. and if the information is changing all the time or if the audience is small there's not a lot of leverage in documentation so 
write all the documents you want. If no one ever reads the document that you wrote, stop writing it. Okay. What if the the team is sort of like big and the responsibility is to um, like like high level architecture so people can start doing their parts? Like it's a, a system that has like maybe seven, six microservices and every each and every one will be working on it. And there, sh there's, there should be some contracts between those services and this kind of situation requires, I think it requires some sort of documentation. Uh, maybe everyone can change it because there is contracts in, in those documents. It's like people will follow those. Um, do, don't you think that like in this area, it requires some sort of documentation, at least for future people maintainers to know what, like, why did, what, why did we did like it this way, especially in projects that has iteration of people, like if like, mm -hmm people come and go. So it's like, when you want to know like the history of this piece. So uh, I, I understand the, the, the desire to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be nice to, uh, if you didn't have to explain stuff, mm -hmm. if uh, somebody new comes in and, uh, you know, you just say, well, here's the doc, read the doc. And the documents, the, this is where the stable information in a yeah, large, okay. yep. a, a, a large, um, the curve, yeah, audience, <laughs> yes, yeah, changes, yes, yeah. So, yeah. so if that information, let's let's say we write the document, yeah. and then the contracts change because they should change because yes. we're going to learn stuff, and if we learn stuff and we don't change the contracts, then re reality and and I the ideal they diverge yeah and the reality diverge more and more yeah so we don't want that so we're going to change it all the time so every time we change a contract now we have to change the document too okay the more thoroughly we've documented the harder that becomes yeah eventually we just stop changing the docs secret y yes but it's yeah. true <laughs> yeah now we have now we paid the price to write the documents. We slowed down development to write the documents. And the docu documents that we wrote, by the time you need them, they're always wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Ooh, decisions, so, yes. Yeah. So, so, so what are you going to do? Well, the extreme programming answer is we're going to rely on the same kind of social, uh, uh, social interactions people use all the time for all kinds of stuff you know yeah. you're you're talking to your uncle they start telling you stories you know well this this is you know oh yeah the family's kind of messed up in this mm -hmm. way let me tell you a funny story or here's why the family a business let's say the family business why do we do things this way oh let me tell you a story about it and the story sticks in your head mm -hmm. that's a social process the information is elicited at the moment it's needed it's accurate because you're talking to a, a real person. The, the presentation of the information is adapted to you and to the relationship that you have. Mm -hmm. Those social processes work for many, many generations. Sometimes mm -hmm. thousands of years, information gets passed generation to generation to generation and it adapts and changes along the way. From an extreme programming perspective, we say, super, yeah, yeah. That's, that's good enough. Now, I'm not, as I said, I'm not saying don't write documentation. Write all the documentation you want. Mm -hmm. If nobody reads it, or- It's useless, yeah. It's very expensive, if, yeah. If, if it's useless, stop doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the one exception, and I've written two books about this, is code for communication. Yeah. So yeah. if you have a thought in your head and you can express it in the code, express it in the code. You, mm -hmm. we, that's the that's the one artifact we're guaranteed we have to have. Yeah. And if you're focused on communicating through code, not just to the computer, but to the other people, then you can put a lot of information in there. Again, I didn't say don't write documentation. I yeah, said yeah, yeah. communicate through the code because you know that's the one artifact you absolutely know you have to have. So 
practice those habits so that you mm-hmm. communicate through the code. And I, and yeah. yeah. I, I I think the um, like maybe uh, the 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 like if if we abstract the problem to the its core, its communication, as you said. So communication first, uh, it could be document, it could be code. Uh, documents is like whatever cheaper method for communication um, is we should go th- like go for um, because we have to pay for code hundred percent all the time. Then code is must exist. Then we can we can emphasize more of our effort there instead of like like having another channel or anything. Um, in the same time, I was like thinking, um, like, do you think like things like TikTok, uh, the t- technical talks and stuff like that? Uh, I, it's part of the social um, like engagement where it's like someone is explaining why we did that. Um, um, I personally prefer 10 minutes video, someone explaining uh, why they did, like, why did they do that? It's like uh, when, when people explain stuff about open source projects, it's, it's like very enlightening. Um, um, do you think like videos, something like that, could be helpful, or or still, um, like people might take it uh, for granted and start building like huge libraries of videos that no one will ever see? That's this. So that's why I'm not t- t- telling you wh- what you should and shouldn't do. You should yeah. definitely try that. Yeah. And include analytics. Mm-hmm. If nobody ever listens to it or watches it, then stop doing it. Yeah. What would what would be silly? As you said, oh, you know, I'm required to spend 40 hours recording professionally, you know, professionally produced videos about, and no one ever watches it. And then the next week I have to do another 40 hours. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's exhausting. Well, I I was talking actually about like very cheap, like low production stuff is like where presentation is like explaining this. I was pushing it to the extreme to, to make yeah. my point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, sure, try that. Yeah. Some of those videos will be more popular than others. Yeah. So, you know, duplicate those. That 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 makes sense to me. It's yeah. it's a relatively low opportunity cost. Mm-hmm. And if it has payoff, then yeah, sure, Keep sure, do it. it. Yeah. But the what. Um, I mean, this is from 30 years ago. People would say, no, no, you have to absolutely document everything. And it's a nice, simple rule. It's just wrong. Yeah. It doesn't, it pretends that there's no judgment involved. And I would prefer, and this is from, from G. Paw Hill, I would pr- pr- prefer to rely on judgment, to accept the fact that no, you can have mistakes sometimes. Mm-hmm. But we have we're paying smart people to do this work why aren't we asking them to make smart decisions exactly yeah well oh yeah, man I, that's a that's a tweet right there <laughs> <laughs> if somebody uh, yeah. if somebody tweets it i will definitely retweet re- retweet that one <laughs> this is cool um i was actually uh when when you, when you are talking about this um i feel again like going back to the core of the problem which is communication if we build a better communication tools uh, to like like github like or not github i mean get get in general and the history of commits if we write clear messages that's i think that's that's considerably enough to know what's going on why this decision why this line wrote this weird thing it's like oh yeah because we had this disaster and the need to circumvent it and that's why we have it here uh, no documentation no search engine nothing is just like open the history and that's it. Um, th- that's totally fun. Uh, there is one question. I think you answered it implicitly, which is the relentless um, refactoring. Um, I, I, I I totally agree on it. Um, but like, can we just go through it? It's like um, the, the the part, the diversion part, and how relent- relentless fa- refactoring um, like w- um, minimize the gap between the reality and the software. Yeah. So. So um, if you accept that uh, all the activities that you do in software development are are uh, continuous processes. So that's that's a basic basic assumption that I make that testing is never done. Coding is never done. Designing is never done. uh, Deployment tools are never done. None none of this stuff is is ever done. This is it's all a process. and It's all going to continue. So that means you're going to spend some of your time designing as you go along. As you realize, oh, 
here's how I wish I'd designed it. Here's how it is designed. All right. Am I going to, am I going to make the investment to bring the, the reality closer to the ideal state? Mm -hmm. Um, now let's, let's look again at extremes. You have a, you have the cost of, of doing the design and then you have the mm -hmm. cost of not doing the design. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, the shape of those curves change over time. So the cost of not doing the design starts out small yeah. and then it grows and grows and grows. Mm. Um, it's, it's tempting. Okay. What are the mistakes that people, people make all the time? It, it's tempting to say we, we need to keep reality and, and, uh, uh, I, on our ideal really, really close. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is uh, sometimes you're wrong about your ideal. So we do, we have some microservices, uh, which I just call services, but there you go. Um, and something's a little bit off. And so we rush to fix it. Well, if we rush to fix it and, and we fix it wrong, mm -hmm then untangling that is is an expensive proposition. So w one of the powerful properties of software is uh, reversibility. Yeah. We make some change, it's, uh, it's wrong, we just revert the diff, and we're back to the state we were in. Mm -hmm. If we haven't launched nuclear missiles or, you know, told the government uh, that we owe them uh, you know, a billion dollars or what, whatever. So there, yeah. at the at the edges in software, we do make irreversible decisions, and we need to be careful about them, and we need to differentiate which ones we do. Nice thing about most design decisions is that they're easily reversible. So, if a decision is easily reversible, you can go ahead and try it. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's wrong, you know, we extract out a helper function have a big function, some segment of it makes sense, we extract it out, we just see, realize we're wrong, okay, we just inline it, okay. we're finished. Yeah. So those, yeah, do, do those a little bit all the time. The, the bigger, the more irreversible decisions, like extracting out a service, that's, that's harder to undo. If we extract out a service and start using it 20 different places and realize, ah, no, we needed it back with the rest of the code that was doing that now, now it's, it's harder to do. So for those decisions, I want to wait a while. I want to let the mess get big enough mm -hmm. that I can start to see what the shape should be. So part of being a software designer is waiting, okay. not, not, not being lazy, not ignoring the problem, but saying, okay, this isn't, my problem isn't big enough yet. Mm -hmm. I, I'm feeling pain and I'm not feeling enough pain to know what to be confident that I know what to do about it because until I'm I'm confident okay here's how the world should be then mm -hmm. I I run this risk of doing the wrong thing to try and fix it uh, so it's, it's, yeah go ahead sorry go ahead <laughs> Um, I, I was about like I, I was I, I was thinking that it's like building a statistical model where we are we want to make sure that our regression of the problem we the way we understand it is clear and this is how we should go then we have enough information we have enough um, enough input uh, of war like what is the ideal step and instead of like small change that doesn't represent much and we take a decision that's expensive and basically screw up another thing or it it wasn't ideal from the beginning. Right. So um, the other question, um, given relentless refactoring, um, um, should we start by uh, test driven, like with with the refactoring or like maybe changing what we have, like morphing it uh, with the old unit, like tests or like how should it go? Because there is oh. old, old assumptions and the new assumptions. It's like, right. So um, my philosophy is always small, safe steps. Okay. Um, uh, it's, it's rare. If I have a working system, I want to change it in small safe steps because it's hard to get to a working system. Um, if, 
it, sometimes the smallest safe step is a big is it seems like a, a pretty big one so you you have some big service this happened i worked at facebook for seven years we'd have some service and everything at facebook is big you know so you're storing a billion photos but you need to store 10 billion photos so you need to take all the billion photos off of the old service and put them onto the onto this new service well that transition process could easily take a year hmm. and you're at every stage you're just you, you stand up the new service and you and you try it out and then you're writing writing new photos to both services at the same time hmm. but then the new service gets uh, and then you throw everything away and you start over again hmm. and then you're writing you know one out of a hundred photos to both services and that one seems to be working and then you write two out of a hundred and then 50 out of a hundred and then you're writing all the photos to both services all the time and then now you start reading from both of them and checking do i get the same answer from both this is the only way to make this kind of transition yep um and it's it seems slow but it's compared to what is always yeah. the question you know compared to failure no it's very fast compared yeah. to failing throwing away all of everyone's photos you know yeah. having everyone leave your site and now your business is done yeah. no it's much faster than that yes so it it it's working in small steps and yeah staying safe the whole time i think mm -hmm. uh programmers underestimate that feeling of safety and how valuable it is if you just oh, know yeah. hey we're no we're good mm -hmm. um you're more creative you're a better teammate you project confidence to the other people who are affected by your decisions so they trust you more um so a lot of good things happen as programmers, somehow we get we get it in our minds that we ought to be at the absolute limits of our abilities. You know, we have these magnificent brains and we want to absolutely use all of them all the time. Yeah. So the the uh, but remember, debugging is always harder than coding. Yeah. So if you ever program at the limit of your abilities, you're guaranteed that you won't be able to debug that software. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, hundred percent agree. Um, I used to spend. Uh, I used to work at Facebook too. Um, it used to take me. I remember there were some bugs. Um, it takes like three days to know what's going on. It's just debugging, like trick, like what's going on. It takes like three days to understand. It's like yeah, this like this little tiny hidden uh, magic number was like somewhere hidden, and it took those three days to figure out that that thing is there and. It, it takes like more three days to understand how to change that without blowing up everything. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's it's pretty interesting. Uh, the, the more the, so it's like basically the escalating the, the 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 level of a challenge. It's like if you keep pushing like hundred percent, it's guaranteed that the challenge will be one hundred twenty percent next time. Right, right, yes. and 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 then you're stuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's miserable. Um, I w I have a question about the test driven development. You wrote the book twenty years ago, and um, like, what are the thoughts that changed since then? Well, I, I have a n new generation. Uh, uh, a student at a, a one of my code camps came up with a, a new process that I really enjoy, uh, and it's called the test commit revert. And it's yeah. written test and and commit or or revert because that's what the command line looks like. And in TCR, uh, you make the change you want to make, and then if the tests all pass, then uh, you automatically make a git revert. So now you can't go backwards, but you know everything's fine. Mm -hmm. If the tests fail, you immediately revert all the changes that you made. So if you program for an hour mm -hmm. and then you pre press save and the test, I like, like it when the tests automatically run. Mm -hmm. You press save, the tests all run, poof, all your code mm -hmm. just disappears. Oh, mm -hmm. that feels so bad. Mm -hmm. I know I didn't make any mistakes. Right? That's what we say as programmers all the time. Mm 
and we're wrong all the time. So how can I break this change down into smaller and smaller and smaller steps? I have, I have three lines of code, and if I type those three lines and I press save, they disappear. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how can I write one of them? Maybe I can write the middle line of code first, and everything will be fine. And then I'll then I can write the last line, and the two will work together. And then the first line. But you've, now you've made real progress, mm -hmm. right? Now you have two lines of code. You're sure of what they do. And then you write the first line, and then it just poof. It just disappears. Mm -hmm. Hmm. 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 Oh, I see. So TCR pushes you to make changes in even smaller steps. I thought with TDD, I was taking small steps because it's one test at a time, right? L lots of people make that mistake. Oh, I'm going to write a bunch of tests and then make them work one by one. And you don't do that. Mm -hmm. You write one test and you make it work. And then you write the next test and you make it work. And then you write the next. You can have a list. You can say, okay, I, you know, I, I, ne negative inputs and the blah, blah, blah. You can have a list of stuff. But write one test at a time. That's those are gigantic steps in the TCR world. Yeah. In the TCR world, you, you're just, you're, you're making one tiny little change at a time. And it's a, it's an intellectual puzzle, but the result is that you know exactly where you are all the time. It's uh, yeah, it's a slow down reinfor reinforcement. It's like you are forced to like slow down because uh, if if uh, if you write like tons of lines of code, it will boof disappear, and <laughs> you will have to write them back again. So it's like yeah, it it encourage you. It's like it's like my brain is like, hey, stop, write line by line, and let's see what's going on. And if things are good, then it will keep going good. And also, I think it it stop one of the bad habits I personally do, which is um, it's like it's not working. Okay, let's let me build more on that thing that doesn't work, and keep pushing, keep pushing until it's like ah. Oh, then it's like ugly 15 lines and then I need to reduce them. Uh, and instead of like thinking simply, it's the other way around. It's like, yeah, let, 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 let's us, like, let us make it small. Um, I, I think I, I need to clarify one thing that test commit uh, revert, uh, like in one line, it's a bash if statement. It's if, right. if test passes, then uh, commit uh, else revert. So right. yeah. That's so, the only thing. so it's uh, it's some root level of your project. You've got three scripts, and they're called test, commit, and revert. And the and the bash statement is test and and commit or or revert. Yeah. And then cool. and then that should trigger, like <clears throat> you you want to trigger that all the time. Yes. Yeah, like uh, regularly, as much as uh, the workflow, like uh, people are different. I like to basically keep build 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 every couple mm -hmm. of lines uh, that's my habit so um, if other people like to write maybe pages and pages of code then test them that's like that's also the, their jam they can keep do that and uh, but still yeah the, the revert will be very painful yeah you can't do that in TCR you, yeah, the, yeah. It, it just creates these, this powerful incentive <clears throat> to make sure so I have a I have a motto uh, for each hard change make the change easy which can be hard then make the easy change and tcr d does that you work extremely hard to make the changes to the code really easy oh yeah yeah so it it, it ends up not being like at the end of a day you're still <sighs> oh yeah. but but the entire day you've made steady progress and you've never you never have to face panic oh, yeah. not like oh god is this gonna work oh maybe put just push it to pride and we'll see what happens like sometimes that's your best situation but you, you, if you, you feed yourself on a steady diet of that you're gonna you're gonna get stomach problems and migraines oh, yeah. and yeah, it's not it's not good and somehow as programmers though we've w this we've internalized this this belief that our job ought to be uh, ought to be emotionally taxing it ought to be scary it ought to you know uh and if, if instead it's just this smooth it you know that 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 also feels good you can learn for that to feel good but somehow people just don't do that i don't i i was the same 
I decided no, I don't. I don't want to feel panicked like that. I yeah, Sim exactly. I I I got all all sort of mental health issues because of work. Then I had to slow down. Um, therapist is like, you need to slow down. It's not gonna yep. work. It's like you will kill yourself before you reach to the end line. So it's like, okay, I'm I'm gonna stop. <laughs> and yeah, I I totally agree with you. Um, uh, there there is um like one question about the your experience at Facebook. Uh, because I'm I'm following you. Like I heard lots of podcasts you talk about. Uh, you you said that uh, you found yourself in in coaching other engineers. And mm -hmm. um, like, please tell me more about like um. What are the findings? What is the best way to help? Like, if if I'm responsible for other people, how can how can I up their game? How can I make them feel safe and uh, the space open for them to grow? So the <laughs> the first thing is this: the space has to be actually safe. You can't you can't you can't get somebody to feel safe if it's not actually safe. Well, well what does that mean? As a I, as, I, yeah, go yeah I, 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 sorry, I interrupted you, but um, as long as we have the uh, reviews and uh, other people's opinions about our work, um, it's painful. I'm, I'm honestly one of the hard months in the year when like people judging me. It's like, did I do good this year? Am I, am I, am I worthy? <laughs> it's like, um, <laughs> what? <laughs> then um, the, the fact that we live in this, um, I, I hate this, like giving feedback and and because we are human. I, I like the aspect where you say it's a social. So um, going to uncle and talking, um, how we will sort this out in a, in a family, it's we will never abandon anyone basically and we will try to work with them. Uh, but what happens is like, yeah, um, you have like two shots, you lose them, then they get this weird uh, program where we rehabilitating you to become like back uh, as, as we found you. Then uh, basically it becomes like weird it's, 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 and it's hard. Um, so, sorry for interrupting you. Yeah, no, 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 no. This is a conversation. It's going to go yeah. back and forth. Um, yeah. So, when when I came up as an engineer, uh, I had the great good fortune of landing next to Ward Cunningham, the guy who invented the wiki, mm -hmm. and uh, and at first he's like, "Yeah, that, you, you can watch me program, but don't touch my keyboard." You know, and I'm 24 years old, um, more hair, mm -hmm. fewer wrinkles, no gray. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I just, I watched, literally just kind of, just watched them in program for a while. And then I started noticing things. Oh, you missed a period there. Oh, you, the parentheses don't balance. Okay. So now I'm now I'm understanding what he's trying to accomplish as his program. And then eventually I'm asking questions. Well, it's called uh, top and bottom here and it's up and down there and it seems to be the same thing. What's the difference? Oh, oh, it should be called top and bottom both places. Oh, oh OK. So now I'm contributing. I, I you know, I'm, I'm I'm the world's most expensive text editor, but at least I'm contributing. And then the conversations would sometimes we'd get in some sticky situation. We have to roll back and go, wow, what's going on here? How is this different from this other situation we saw? And so we'd have conversations about it and we'd dive back in. And then I started having ideas. Well, why don't we do this? I don't understand what you're talking about. Well, how about if, how about if I type for a while? So I would, I have the keyboard just for a minute like this. Oh yeah, I get it. I get it. And then he'd take the keyboard back. And we organically developed this pair programming style. I mean, it's not unique to us. Lots of programmers have worked in this style, but we, we developed this kind of back and forth the whole time. There was no pressure on me to produce. I think this is a huge mistake that we make with young programmers. Now we think everyone should be producing at their maximum capacity at all times. Well, then you don't invest in the in the next generation. And this organic process of passing knowledge on through the generations of programmers has fallen apart. And I saw that at Facebook. So I responded to it by recreating it. I would be the 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 senior in that conversation with a 
a, a bunch of, of juniors. And that was my highest light leverage activity. So I spent most of my time doing that kind of coaching and then built this uh, coaching program go good to great that matched up senior engineers with junior engineers and recreated that experience that I had had as a junior engineer where you, you don't expect the juniors to like begin producing a lot right from the beginning. It's ridiculous. They're juniors. That's what the, that's what it means. Let's make the investment to help them become senior engineers, to become fully productive engineers, well-rounded engineers. Let's make that investment. And that's a highly leveraged thing for a senior engineer to do. Now, the that program at Facebook fell apart after I left and was canceled. Managers hated it because their senior engineers were wasting their time talking to junior Oh, you know, this is an incentives problem. Yeah. The the those managers face really perverse incentives. They don't. They're what's good for them is not what's good for Facebook. It's not what's good for the engineers. Either of the engineers, because both people get a lot out of this interaction. Um, and still, I I expect better of. A, man, a manager as a manager you know you you've accepted greater responsibility and with that comes a, a, it's more important that you you don't make bad decisions um so that, that that's the that coaching process really was a simulation of what i saw with my dad and my dad was an enge a engineer electrical engineer and then a, a software engineer growing up i watched his interactions with junior engineers I had that experience as, as I came out and I wanted to recreate that. Mm -hmm. now you, you ask, how do you create safety as a coach in that relationship? That's a, it's a really hard job. Um, it's, uh, oftentimes an intellectual challenge to figure out, you know, how am I going to reach Here's Somebody, I see what's blocking them, but I don't like, I would, wake up in the middle of the night with ideas of, oh, maybe we try this and see what happens. Mm -hmm. The emotional challenge is, is even harder uh, to create safety for somebody else. You have to have your own act together. I don't know if that's a phrase that I'm not sure how that would tr translate. You, you, you have to be okay with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. If we're in a coaching situation and you say something and I'm reminded of some situation and I start to panic, like mm -hmm. you're going to flip, you, you know, you're like, ah, I don't know what's wrong with this guy, but I shouldn't, I shouldn't say stuff like that. It has mm -hmm. to be really okay for you to come with your stories and say, okay, I'm in this situation. And I, I, I think, okay, yeah, well, I, I've, I've been there. Let me tell you a story about what went on M most of the time the that relationship is based on storytelling that's so, interesting yeah it, it's uh, it's never it's never technical stuff nobody oh, yeah, ever yeah. wants me to explain test driven development nobody ever yeah. wants me to explain refactoring no d design patterns none of no it's like oh people think i'm such a jerk <laughs> hmm. okay well we can talk about that people think i'm a jerk too sometimes so let's talk about what that's like and to what degree are you actually a jerk? Mm -hmm. Okay, if if you and I come together uh, about that, and I don't think, oh well, you know, you yes, you are a jerk, and I'm going to fix you right then. No, that's not it. It's like, hey, we're two people. Mm -hmm. I've experienced more of life than you have, just mm -hmm. years, miles. Uh, I've been through this too. There have been periods in my life when I rubbed people really the wrong way. And here's what I did about it. You know, what of that is about you? What of that's about them? I can't tell you that, but I can tell you. So it's kind of like that, that, that uncle telling you the stories. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, um, I, I feel that the biggest part is being, um, being at peace internally. It's like I'm at peace and being open to like because at peace means that nothing will trigger me as long as the conversation is going then um the ground will feel yeah we can go we can walk here 
then the more they talk, the more we like have a conversation, it's like a dance, then the trust increase and we can have like more sophisticated conversations and we can keep doing it. Um, but I, when I think about it, the, 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 the environment at companies, it makes it slightly a little bit difficult. It's like, as you said, Facebook just canceled the project because they don't see where it's going. In the same time, when I think about it, um, th that's the long term thinking. It's not like the short term. The long term thinking says it's like if you can increase, at least increase the productivity of those junior engineers by maybe 10%. Um, the, 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 like 10 engineers means that you hired one person and they are basically dying to hire more people. So thinking that you can increase the, 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 the throughput of, <laughs> of the people, that's, that's, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's a questionable why this is not like a good, like a thing, maybe because it's not measurable, like we can, it can't be measured. Uh, but, but I, I, not, not, I, not easily. So at Facebook, the, the, I mean, there, there was tremendous uh, pressure to measure everything. And uh, so HR studied the people that I had coached and uh, found peers, people similar to those people who hadn't gotten coached. And uh, they tried to be as scientific as possible. I, I don't I don't feel the need, but if somebody needs to do it, go ahead. And so they tried to be as scientific as possible and say, well, what was the effect of coaching? And what they discovered is uh, the people who had gotten coached were twice as likely to get promoted in the year following coaching as the people who hadn't gotten coached. And increasing promotion velocity is is a huge lever for yeah. for uh, an organization. So th there are some numbers out there. I don't really trust it, but if somebody needs to do, uh, like, I'm glad it confirmed. If they if they said uh, no, no, everyone I coached left the company. That would be bad, but uh, no. In, in fact, it it does like from a even from a numbers perspective. I, I'm more interested in the qualitative perspective. Mm -hmm. I still have strong relationships with many of my students, mm -hmm. and we s still talk eight, ten years later. That's good. Um, yeah. So. I don't I don't need numbers to convince yeah. me that this is a this is a valuable activity. Cool. Um, like as we are talking about the HR and like uh, uh, people um, like what do you think about the the hiring and interviewing new engineers? Because that's like one of the most <laughs> I'm not going to complete. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. this is such a difficult process. And yeah. um, I, and I don't have an answer. Oh, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's it's subjective. <laughs> yeah, I know that the that the hiring processes that uh, a Google or a Facebook uses, they're faced with an impossible set of constraints. So as an engineer, I'd say it's an over constrained situation. It should be unbiased. It has to scale to mm -hmm a funnel that starts with a million resumes and ends up with 10,000 hiring yeah. a, a, the, a yes decision on 10,000 engineers. So it has to has to be unbiased, which it's never going to be. It has to scale to this incredible, uh, incredible dealing with incredible numbers. Uh, it has to be inexpensive for the company. It has to be inexpensive for the applicants. Like, there's just no way that you're gonna you're gonna everything. satisfy all those constraints at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, still, the best way I know to interview is the pair program. Okay. And there are certain people who are going to be excluded in that process. Mm -hmm. So, people on the autism spectrum, uh, even people who might be okay in a s social software development situation uh but it, they need to develop relationships first mm -hmm. those people are just never going to be hired out of a pair programming interview because they they're not going to look like they're very good yeah. so ah yeah i i don't know it, this is a huge problem mm -hmm. uh i think the the more realistic the situation is the better mm -hmm. but also recognize that there are people who will work well under 
under pressure once they're in a team that'll work terribly under pressure when they're not part of the team. So are you just going to accept that you exclude all those people? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I interviewed at Google once and they gave me some, some dumb system design problem. And the answer was really easy. I'll put a cache at every node. And I just totally fumbled Mm. the question. I, I, you know, I started trying to ask, like, what are they really getting at? This has got to be more complicated than this. And yeah, I was out. Oh, and yeah. so, like, I, you know, if me with 35 years of experience don't didn't handle that pressure well, I, I think it was a false negative. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, it's Google. They get to decide and they have all the word, world's money. So, yeah. Uh, before we ended, I wanted to come back to uh, uh, something you brought up in the beginning, which is uh, in Egypt, you've got a very particular situation and people try to put process over people yeah. yep. which is like I understand it and it's inexcusable mm-hmm. um, but the situation in Egypt is different than anywhere else you, you have your own culture you have your own set of business constraints yeah. um, I've done a, a, a lot of work in Africa uh, different parts of Africa Central Africa South Africa and uh, my friend uh, uh, Barry Dwalatsky, who was a professor of Vitz University, always talked about in an African context. He always say in an African context. And I thought, yeah, come on, come on. There's it really is different. He yeah. was right, I was wrong. It really is different. And if you take something like extreme programming, even which when I approach a team, that's the perspective. That's the best way I know how to approach. How are we going to work together? That it has to be shaped by the context in which you work. That that means that you can't instantly roll out a digital transformation to the entire organization. Yeah, boohoo. You can you can do it fast quickly though, if you grow like a tree grows. Right, one, two, four, eight, da, 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 and you can have a big tree, and it can get big. It's but it's not going to get big all at once. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I'd encourage you to explore what that means. What is it? <clears throat> what is different about Egyptian culture that makes? I, now, in my heart of hearts, as a geek, I don't think that means well. Test-driven development just isn't going to work because it's a. TDD is a geeky response to a geeky, geeky set of constraints. Yes. But, um, like, the, the, we're, we're trying to create two things, a rich social network and short mm-hmm. feedback loops. Mm-hmm. And how that plays out in your situation is going to be different than how somebody is going to do it in Japan or someone's going to do it in Russia or someone's going to do it in China or someone's going to do it in Australia, even in different companies inside of each of those national cultures, or what, what it means to create a rich social network and short feedback loops is going to be different. Yeah. But the, the richer we are connected to each other as humans, mm-hmm. the more we create together. Yeah. And the shorter the feedback loops are, the easier it is to create that network, even though sometimes we have conflict, and the more value that we're going to create together. I don't expect that to be the same all over the world. Uh, some of the I, programming stuff is going to be is going to look very familiar place to place, and some of the social stuff is going to look very different. Yeah. And that's I, good. I, yeah, I think the the um, I had my startup in Egypt. Um, I believe the problem is there is a manager and there is a leader, and we don't have enough leaders. And in, in, it's like in Egypt, we don't have the technical leaders where you um, inspires you and and give you it's like wow, this this guy's like I I want to sit beside him and and see what he's doing. Um, there is lots of um, I'm sorry to say it, but there is lots of fakes. It's like people who just became like team leaders because. They are the oldest. Maybe they they have been here for since forever, and 
they are not inspiring um and 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 they don't like the, there is huge uh mismatch of energy it's like when you have like someone young it's like it's like yeah give me the world i can break it it's like and it's like yeah i i i hardly walk uh, this is like mis a big mismatch um you need someone to match that's like if someone is rhyming in a certain wave it's like you need to take it up with them it's like you don't say i'm tired i can't um, if you can't, then you should find a good place for yourself if, if, if it's like you can't go with it. Um, but I can for sure say that's like if, if, if we have enough energy, it's like the matching energy, leadership uh, and leadership. Again, it's some people say it's like being a manager is like, no, um, someone might be walking on the street and you consider them a leader because the way they inspire me, that the, the way they like the values that they have, the things that I appreciate. So um, as Egyptian, um, I'm also we are very oriented to families and like our like social ties. And that's a huge part. It's like um, it needs more of a brother. It's like I, I'm not saying it's like it need to be intimate, it's like brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, it's not like that. It's they need to feel the superiority of the person um, on intellectual level and human level so they can look at them and learn from them. Um, because that's like a, I don't know, it's like, it, it feels like a brain shortcut when you like someone's like, yeah, this person has what I need and mm -hmm. I will suck it from them. Um, and that's not happening, um, which makes like all the things going crazy with the management's like, ah, oh, let's have uh, this process, this and that. And while the problem, I always like 100% of like, whenever I talk to my friends in Egypt, it's 100% attitude. It's like if this change a little bit, this attitude, the way we hire, it's like even hiring. Uh, it's funny because w um, when I had my startup, I used to hire people who don't pass my interviews. It's like because I ask for a certain thing, which is attitude and uh, specific things like, um, can you come back in a week and it's like answer those questions? Here is the books. Here is the questions. And please come back in a week. And they do that. And because they were not ashamed and they look at the book. I actually hire them because that's actually what I need. It's like I need someone I can fill their brain with stuff. So mm -hmm. that's um, that's my perspective on it. Um, I I, uh, I I think we are stepped over the one hour, but uh, I had lots of other questions. But but yeah, uh, well, <laughs> talking I'll with just, you is like yeah. I'll just have to come to Egypt. Yeah, we'll sit down together, have yeah. some good food, and we'll finish the conversation. Yeah, I'm I'm here in California. I uh, <laughs> I moved oh. I moved I moved six years ago. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm currently at Apple. So <laughs> way oh, way it's, from then it's easier. Excuse me. Then then it'll be even easier. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. I I hope we meet someday. <laughs> it's like Absolutely. you are in San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Nice and simple. Yes. Super. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for the inv invitation to uh, to start the conversation. I, uh, that, I mean, the, one thing I always try to remember is that it, this is hard because it's really hard. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's not, there's not a simple solution that we're just missing. And if only we, you know, all took the same shot, it, 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 all the problems would go away. We're, we're dealing with genuinely hard problems about what it really means to be a human being. And so that's why it's difficult. That's why there's no solution. There's no solutions. There's only progress. Yep. Um, and uh, but I'd rather be making the progress than not be making the progress. And yes. clearly not making progress is one of the options out there. And because lots of people don't. So, yes. Thank you thank so you much. So much. Yeah, th I'm, 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 I really appreciate the time you have put with us um, um, and wish you have a great weekend. All right. Thanks a yeah. lot. Talk okay, to you soon. Bye-bye.